We begin with the poem, The Village Preacher. The village preacher, near yonder copse where once the garden smiled, and still where many a garden frog grows wild, there where a few torn shrubs the place disclose, the village preacher's modest mansion rose. A man he was to all the country dear and passing rich with 40 pounds a year. Remote from towns he ran his godly race, nor ever changed nor wished to change his place. And practice he to fawn or seek for power by doctrines fashioned to the wearing hour. Far other aims his heart had learned to prize, more skilled to raise the richer than to rise. His house was known to all the vagrant train. He chid their wanderings but relieved their pain. The long-remembered beggar was his guest, whose beard descending swept his aged breast. The ruined spendthrift, no longer proud, claimed kindred there and had his claims allowed. The broken soldier kindly bade to stay, sat by his fire and talked the night away, wept o'er his wounds or tales of sorrow done shouldered his crutch and showed how fields were won. Pleased with his guests, the good man learned to glow and quite forgot their vices in their woe. Careless their merits or their faults to scan, his pity gave, her charity began. Thus to relieve the wretched was his pride and even his failings lean to virtue's side. But in his duty prompt at every call, he watched and wept, he prayed and felt for all. And as a bird each fond endearment tries to tempt its new-fledged offspring to the skies, he tried each art, reproved each dull delay, allured to brighter worlds, and led the way. Beside the bed where parting life was laid, and sorrow, guilt, and pain by turns dismayed, the reverend champion stood. At his control, despair and anguish fled the struggling soul. Comfort came down the trembling wretch to raise, and his last faltering accents whispered praise. Church with meek and unaffected grace, his looks adorned the venerable place. Truth from his lips prevailed with double sway, and fools who came to scoff remained to pray. The service passed around the pious man. With steady zeal, each honest rustic ran. Even children followed with endearing wile and plucked his gown to share the good man's smile. His ready smile a parent's warmth expressed. Their welfare pleased him and their cares distressed. To them his heart, his love, his griefs were given, but all his serious thoughts had rest in heaven. As some tall cliff that lifts its awful form, Swells from the vale and midway leaves the storm. Though round its breast the rolling clouds are spread, eternal sunshine settles on its head. Oliver Goldsmith. This poem by Oliver Goldsmith, named The Village Preacher, I think it's from the 
poem, The Deserted Village, is one of the magnificent poems uh, in this whole collection. It talks about the highest state of human perfection. In Bhagavad Gita, we have studied the portion of Sita Pragna, a man of steady wisdom where various qualities of a man of perfection are uh, given by Lord Krishna. We see very many parallels of that in this, uh, in this poem. There are two poems which talk about a picture of perfection in this collection. One is this, which is uh, the village preacher and couple of poems later, a king of Persia is portrayed in the poem, even this shall pass away, where it is showing how an objective person conducts himself in and through all experiences of life. But in this poem, various qualities are given at various levels of the personality as to how it expresses itself. How does he relate at the physical level in terms of his service to others? How does he express his emotions and what is his idea or thought at the intellectual level? Not only that, how does he relate even to wealth and material comforts? So very many aspects are covered, we will not be, I, I don't know if we will be able to do full justice in the, in the time given such as the Depth, each and every one quality that is given here can be taken up for discussion for maybe hours together. Like that is the construct of this poem. So we'll dive straight into it. Near yonder copse, where once the garden smile, and still very many a garden flower grows wild, there were a few torn shrubs. The place disclosed the village preacher's modest mansion rose. I think the background of the poem is set around the time of industrial revolution in England where people are leaving the villages and the countryside to go to the cities in search of better livelihood. So it is this setup that it's being talked about in this, in this poem. And what are the impacts of it also, he is going to say in the next couple of, uh, in the next couple of lines. But it is very clear from the picture that is given here, what is the background of this village and where is this village preacher stationed, where is he headquartered. So once there was a garden smiling there, that means it was a, probably a very well maintained place. Uh, the whole surroundings and everything was there because of a lot of people were available and a lot of things were getting done there. But obviously the picture depicts now that uh, it is not as much as people are there and therefore whatever is uh, going on there is, uh, is growing by itself. That is why even now some garden flower grows wild there but once a proper garden was there. And now there are a few torn shrubs That's, that is where the, the place is there. But that is where the village preacher's modest mansion rose. Modest mansion actually, it is like, uh, what do we say? It is, I do not know if we can use the term transferred epithet here, but because he, this person is actually, is very, very modest and his house uh, is like the, is like a palace. Palace means, it is not really a palace. But that is the feeling with which he is living there. His was a great mansion there. In fact, in the great Vaishnava tradition, particularly in the south, all the great Acharyas and great people, even in their Paribhasha or the way of expression, they will only ask, where is your great your, your palace? Palace means that is how they consider the great person, wherever he is living, it is feeling that he is living in a palace. And when it comes to their own house, they will not boast themselves like that. But when it comes to others, they express it like that. You can see a parallel here. The village preacher's modest mansion. It was very modest, but it was a mansion that rose there. So this is the setting of the village preacher's house there. And now the description comes. In the Sthita Prajna also, where Arjuna is asking about... Uh, 
uh, what is the the questions in Bhagavad Gita are very very uh, striking. He asks, uh, how does he? What is his description? How does he uh, sit? How does he walk? How does he talk? All these are the questions. So it is obviously these questions convey a deeper implication, and we know it from the answers. So in the first two verses of the answers, Krishna gives the perfect definition and what is he inside. But in the next one, he says, Yes, Sarvatra Anabhisnehaha Tattat Prakesh Vashuvam. He is there everywhere, unattached, friendly to all. So that is his, how he moves about. So it is exactly like that. This he is a very grand opening is given here as to what his nature is. A man he was to all the country dear. That means he was a very, very likable and lovable personality. Everybody adored him. Everybody liked him. He was very close and very dear to everybody. And the next sentence is very interesting. And passing rich with 40 pounds a year. What is richness? We have dealt in detail when we covered how to deal with money in that, in that uh, session. Uh, how a person cannot answer this questions, are you, uh, question, are you rich or are you poor by merely referring to his assets or bank balance alone or his income. It is in relation with reference to what his inner status, how his desires are contained within it. In other words, the question is whether you feel rich or not. So, 40 pounds in a year, how does he get, we do not know whether, whether from his investment or in his church there is a, some provision to give or some pension that he gives, all that is immaterial, but just 40 pounds a year that he gets. But, passing rich with 40 pounds a year, passing rich means he feels extremely rich about his material status. So, irrespective of what you have as your bank balance, irrespective of what is your income, are you able to contain your desires within the assets so that you feel rich? That is the question. So, feeling rich is very essential than being rich. And uh, a person can have even millions and trillions and yet he can feel poor, he can still have a beggar attitude and still seek for more. Seek in the sense of yearning and wanting without which you feel miserable in that sense. So, but this person with a very, very modest amount feels extremely rich, passing rich with 40 pounds a year. Remote from the towns he ran his godly race. See, referring to towns here uh, is not uh, obviously giving a, a negative connotation to what is a city and a town vis-a-vis -a, -vis a village. What it means is there is a lot of effervescing activity and industries and revolution and this and that that is going on there. He is cut away from all those things. He is quite content in his place and he is nor ever had changed nor wished to change his place. Whenever there is going to be uh, a change outside, most of us go and adopt that change because we are forced to go into that line by what is known as our herd instinct. There is no thinking in what. Everybody goes and buys a house there and then they buy a farmhouse there. You also do it. Whether you will have time to spend to farmhouse or whether you have a farm or something there, all that is not there. Each, if each and everybody does something, you also do it. Everybody leaves the village and goes in search of a job in the city or everybody leaves there and goes to America for a uh, software and other things, you simply follow that herd mentality without any thinking. But this person did not change at all. He did not change. See, the point is that does not mean that you by staying in a village alone you are achieving something great. That's not the point. What is the purpose? In fact, so here we see a great virtue given in Vedanta known as contentment. Contentment is a very great virtue where with reference to your material things, with reference to your lifestyle, with reference to what has been provided to you, you are extremely happy about it. Everything is taken as God's grace and considered bountiful. That is the main thing. It is not that you are somehow putting up with it and not happy about it. Contentment is a virtue where you are genuinely happy about what you possess. 
your mind is satisfied with what you have and that is what is we related to richness in the previous uh, line there so exactly like that with reference to his personal belongings wherever he is whatever he is doing that also is very much okay in terms of even whatever his services that he is offering can you not go to the world reform the world build big institutions no i am extremely happy in whatever i can do and whatever i can offer to the people that are available here so i really do not find a necessity for me to change uh, for me to change my place ultimately you need to ask this question even if this urge comes why should i even move out what is the purpose is there anything that i am not see suppose if i am not feeling comfortable here if there is something lacking or a lacuna that i feel only then i try to change my position so that i feel satisfied there but that is not the case here the case here is extremely satisfied so he is doing what he is supposed to do being in that place only remote from towns he ran his godly race godly race probably refer, referring to the, all the simple minded and simple that uh, living in the village who are continuing to live that life in the same way in that sense in other words it is not that all the villages are great and all the city or town people are bad nothing like that a person in this context who is running after materiality and sensuality compared to that a person who is there is uh, somewhat um, you know in general content in his mental level so in that sense he was leading them he was guiding them remote from the towns he ran his godly race nor ever had changed nor wish to change his place there was no urge also it is not that someday you know that uh, thing comes out he was absolutely peaceful absolutely content with whatever he had and wherever he stayed unpracticed he to fawn or seek for power by doctrines fashion to the varying art for far other aims his heart had learned to prize more skill to raise the wretched than to rise Uh, as i said each and every aspect of this poem is very very powerful and as we we will not be doing justice to the 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 points that are given here uh he doesn't know what it is to fawn fawn means to uh to flatter to praise somebody and to get things and he does not know that at all he has uh, never ever done that he does not know what it is or to seek for power probably with the knowledge that he has with the stature that he has he can command a lot of power and people are running behind or whether see it is like uh, how even people leave everything and they want to serve the society um, they may join a club like um, rotary club or lions club but even there there is a lot of politics as to who is the president and there is a lot of politics in the election and this and that so many things are there there is that you may give up certain things at the material level but you want something at the subtler level but there is no such um, there is no such yearning or craving for this person at any level he does not seek power at all by doctrines fa- fashion to the wearing hour at this point of time okay uh, if you need to even teach this you need to enlist yourself here here if you want to get yourself grant you must be enlisted there like that each and every new laws can come new bylaws can come at fashion fashion to everything uh, now if it is not here you have to go only for the online classes if online is not there it's not possible so each and every new thing that is there for which you adapt and adjust yourself just to be in the good books of others or just to be in the limelight or just to be in the power he just really does not know that unpracticed he to form or seek for power by doctrines fashion to the various varying are at one one time whatever is ruling the world whatever is uh, actually being um, said that you must follow or that is the fashion at that point of time he is not uh, really uh, for it he is not moved by it why because why does he not get tempted by all those things why does he not seek power for other aims his heart had learned to prize more skill to raise the wretched than to rise he has set his mind at higher goals and higher ideals in life only when i am not having that will i be uh, chasing my selfish dreams so therefore i need some money i need a house here i need to establish myself even if i want to do the work i have to position myself all these thoughts will be there only my only when my ego and egocentric desires are actually uh, pushing me but that is not the case with this person extremely a ideal 
oriented person, an extremely unselfish or selfless person he is. For other aims his heart had learned to prize. So the key here is, if you are wanting to get out of lower temptations and desires, you cannot do so by wanting to drop them or trying to move away from them. It's just not possible. Like in the famous Birbal or Tenali Nama story where you say that you cannot make that line short. There is a line drawn in the court and a person challenges that who will make this line short without touching that line. You cannot make that line short uh, by any way dealing with that line. You cannot touch it. So therefore you have to only draw a line next to it which is a bigger line. Only then this will appear small. Exactly like that. If you want to have, and this in fact is renunciation. Renunciation is growth by knowledge, by virtue. So, by his higher values, by his higher knowledge, his mind has begun to appreciate higher things in life. He has begun to appreciate greater goals in life, higher ideals in life based on which all other things in comparison are not worthy of his pursuit at all. So they do not tempt him at all. He is not bothered about them at all. For far other aims his heart had learned, learned to prize. That prize is a key word that you begin to value it. You will begin to value it only when you are deeply in thought about it and it begins to sort of open up your avenues to it. And that is why we say that constant reflection of this knowledge is very important. Vedanta exposes us only to these higher aspects of life, higher avenues of life. It only says these things are there for you, why don't you look at it, that's all. It Once you mull over it, only then the penny drops and at some point of time you will be able to value it. And based on that value, you will be able to appreciate that. Once you begin to appreciate that, you exactly set the right values to everything else in life. So when you set the right values, how will you be tempted by a little bit of town life or city life or a, or a village life? Everything at that level remains the same. So with reference to material life, there is extreme contentment that comes there. Far other aims his heart had learned to prize. More skill to raise the wretched than to rise. So that means is extremely not focused upon his personal development at all. He is more skilled to raise the wretched. So his constant thought flow is as to how he can be of help to others. That is the extreme unselfish attitude. So we talked about this uh, object, engagement and purpose. This is a person who has a purpose. And his purpose, his skill is to look into the welfare of others. So Swami Vivekananda says, your true joy lies in Seeking the joy of others, providing the joy of others, working for the joy of others, that's all it is. That is where you are going to get the true joy. If I am going to only look forward to my joy with reference to what I am going to get for me, myself at the body, mind and intellect level, I am going to miserably fail. The real joy is, is in making others happy. And that is what this village preacher is skilled at. More skilled to raise the wretched than to raise. Whoever is requiring whatever help at that point of time to provide that, that is a speciality. So he is more skilled at that than to even bother about, he might be having a couple of clothes to wear and a modest house. He does not even think about even expanding his uh, material comforts because he is constantly focused on the welfare of others. More skilled to raise the wretched than to rise. His house was known to all the vagrant train. He chid their wanderings but relieved their pain. The long remembered beggar was his guest whose beard descending swept his aged breast. The ruined spendthrift now no longer proud claimed kindred there and had his claims allowed. The broken soldier kindly bade to stay sat by his fire and talked the night away, wept over his wounds or tales of sorrow done, shouldered his crutch and showed how field were won. Pleased with his guests, the good man learned to glow and quite forgot their vices in their woe. It is a very, this particular passage of the poem is talking about 
how he related to people and who are all his guests in a couple of classes before we dealt with this uh, poem called the pineapple and the bee the pineapple and the bee poem ended with what a sattvic person how he derives his happiness it says they whom truth and wisdom lead can gather honey from a weed at that time we mentioned that this can be explained when we come to village preacher and that is what this portion is as they whom truth and wisdom lead can gather honey from a weed means he is not deriving something out of the honey and therefore he is uh, uh, something out of the weed and just a small pleasure that he is going through not like that he is having that art of having that pleasure from within himself which is in effect what is a sense of a sattvic happiness um which has come about because of the clarity of his intellect such a person who is able to feel that happiness from within you place him in any circumstance you place him with any type of people you place him in any circumstance he is extremely happy and content with whatever he is encountering there that is what it is who are the guests of these people not the great vips or politicians or uh, great pundits and rich people no his house was known to all the vagrant train see such a person whoever lives a simple life like this but a very big heart he has a very great uh, uh, thinking he has he has opened his house for everybody anybody is welcome there okay his house was known to all the vagrant train means quite useless people wandering people here and there who have nowhere else to go nothing else to do like that people also it was not at all he chid their wanderings but relieved their pain so it was not that he was encouraging their tamas or something like that whatever proper advice has to be given whatever uh, the corrective measures has to be taken for them he gave them the right thing wherever a, a scolding needs to be done that also he will do okay but relieved their pain in his presence they were able to relieve themselves of their pain he was able to do this. so people came to him for solace people came to him for just merely spending time and uh, maybe whatever woes they had uh, uh, they they wanted some relief and he was he was doing exactly that he was able to relieve their pain and who are his uh, friends a long remembered beggar was his guest whose beard descending swept breeze but some old beggar who is obviously not shaven and nothing his his beard is uh, they have grown up to his chest a beggar beggar means who has nothing the ruined spendthrift who now no longer proud a person who was extravagantly spending all the time and uh, who was no longer proud means he was a very proud person before such a person such a egoistic person nobody will be able to relate to him but now this village preacher is there he is ready to entertain such a person also claim candidate there and ha- had his claims allowed he will say that you know uh, our forefathers are related we are related like that something he will claim and he will come there of course whether he says that or not it doesn't matter but he is yeah 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 right 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 i understand and this uh, village preacher will go ahead and uh, and listen to him uh, and then the third person was a broken soldier and soldiers are again usually very proud people who were uh, who, who were in the military and they always used to talk about their battles and their life there like that it is uh, the broken soldier kindly bade to stay sat by his fire and talked the night away he was there throughout his night and talking to this person and what he would talk he wept over his wounds or tales of sorrow done how he suffered during his uh, his tenure and uh, uh, what all uh, he went through in the battle and various points of time in the army like that he will talk about his whole tales and then again and again see these people you will you will understand you will have to relate to such people they after having spent their life in a big way they do not have anything to look forward to in life and then what happens is that they will be like some old people in the house they will keep on talking about it again and again 
So that is why even in the house when you relate to such old people, it will not be easy. Why are you saying this again and again? I know, watch this video, do something and people will go away. You cannot really uh, relate to them. You need to have extreme objectivity and extreme patience just to even listen to them. And you know what they are going to say and they are going to repeat it again and again and again. Beyond a point, it becomes monotonous, it becomes boring. Don't you have anything else to say? Or, you know, why are you boring me like this to death? This sort of a thing is what you will have. Even for the sake of respect and other things, you keep quiet. Inwardly, you feel extremely bugged about the whole situation. But that is not the case with this person, village preacher, because he says, he's, this line is important, pleased with his guests. So he's not putting up with his guests. He is not merely... Uh, Indifferent, okay, you, you keep on telling your brother, I will do something else. No, he is patiently listening to them and the good man learned to glow. So actually, is it like that? So he is with them when they are saying it and that is what is important. When you want to really help others, uh, what others are expecting is not really the quantity of your time but the quality time. When you are with them, are you with them fully? See, Swamiji talks about few people who go to hospitals and do the services. There are people who may not be having any relatives or friends. So some people find out those people in the hospital like that and go and spend time with them in the visiting hours. It is just that being in the hospital bed and going through the pain and other things, the treatment there, uh, they need some relief actually. And these people are just available for them just to listen to them, nothing else. It's a great service actually. But you need that objectivity and patience for which you must have strength. You must have strength internally to go through all these things. So, uh, wept over his wounds or tales of sorrow done, shoulder his crush and show how the fields were run. He demonstrates again and again. He talks about his uh, great uh, things that he has done in the army and he talks proudly about it. But this village preacher pleased with his guests. He was extremely happy about whatever they are saying and doing. The good man learned to glow and quite forgot their vices in the woe. This is how you are able to relate to other people. Here is a very uh, important message that is given. In other words, everybody has Guna, everybody has dosha. Guna means positive qualities. Dosha means negative qualities. Virtues and vice. And uh, a great saint says, what is actually dosha? What is actually evil? What is actually a vice? Is actually to constantly look at the guna and dosha of others. Not to look into the positive and negative, but relate to them as it is, that is a great virtue. Now, if you want to improve our relationship with any persons, any person, be it your wife, be it your husband, be it your friend, be it your manager, the moment we confront them, what strikes us is their negative quality and then that puts us off. We are not able to relate to them. Rather, if you want to have a continued positive relationship, look at their vices, look at their good qualities. Try to emulate them or try to get inspired by them. In that process, actually, the other things will fade into insignificance. Now, that does not mean that you will not want to correct it or something like that. But that should not bother you in the first place to relate to them. So, please with this guest, the good man learned to glow and quite forgot their vices in their woe. See, he understands that ultimately that they have come here um, to relieve themselves and they, you know, and he is there available for them uh, to, to, to provide whatever help. So, in this process, if you are going to constantly re remember about negative things and other things, you will not be able to do justice to what you have set yourself to do. You will be constantly thinking about their negativities, then they are wasting your time, then a lot of host of other emotions will come. So this is a quality also which can be uh, parallelly talked about as uh, a forgiveness, that you are able to understand them as they are, but you are able to accept them as they are. You are able to accept them as they are and you are 
you are okay with it you are perfectly okay with what you are doing you know that sort of a thing it is not from an egoistic stance that you put up with them also you are at an even level having a positive emotion towards them pleased with his guests a good man learned to glow and quite forgot their vices in their woe careless their merits or their faults to scan his pity gave where charity began this line is given in italics so it's a very important line this is one poem where Swamiji has highlighted a couple of other places. That's why I said it's a, it's a very wealthy poem with a lot of values here and there. So, he was not uh, having any idea to scan their faults uh, uh, or uh, what they are good or bad or other things because his pity gave ere charity began. He was deaf, whatever he could probably with even the passing rich with 40 pounds a year, he will definitely give something to the beggar also. So that is charity. But that is the charity that we know. So charity, again we have dealt it in before in detail. So I may not be able to uh, go through in detail. But we said it operates at three levels. And all the three levels are shown by this village preacher. The first level is at the physical level where there is actual charity. And second level is what is given here in this sentence his pity gave where charity began which is a attitude of charitable disposition at the mental level that wanting to help is very important that you are given being in a position to help others here pity is not a weak emotion here that you empathize with others and understand their position from your level and that feeling is very important before you do any charity so at the mental level irrespective of what the other person is what his position is you are able to feel for him at that point of time that is a very vital aspect of charity a person can be a, a rich person his car has got stuck somewhere and he is without help there to help him at that point of time by pushing the car is actually the charity you feel for him at that point of no he is a rich person he can do everything you know he could be various other things that you can that can run through your mind just because of his position of riches that is not the case anybody at any point of time whatever help they need if you are able to feel that that is being charitable and this if you are able to do by understanding that person's level as he is accepting as he is irrespective of even if you have even differences at the ideological level all that doesn't matter that is where rational sufferance comes at the intellectual level. So, village preacher is showing all the virtues at the at all the levels. Extremely a charitable person. And before charity, what is important is that charitable disposition. You are able to feel what others require at that point of time. And that is indicated by this uh, word pity here. His pity gave where charity began. Before he could do even the actual charity his feeling was there the charitable disposition was there thus to relieve the wretched was his pride and even his failings leading to virtuous virtue, virtue side so what was his pride again pride is here do not take it again in a very negative way and that is why in the next line he says if at all if it is a failing also it leaned to the virtue side if pride is a sense of satisfaction here yeah, that you have done what is what you are supposed to do and what was that pride having uh, that's to relieve the wretched yes god has put in a position where he can relieve the pain of others he feels extremely satisfied about it even if he felt a sense of uh, a feeling that yes i have done the right thing that alone you can call him uh, call as his failings even his failings lead to virtue side not only that this line even his failings lead to virtue side can be independently taken and understood in a different and a deep way. A man of perfection, however his expression is, whatever his expression is, it may apparently show some deficiency, it may apparently show some failing, but ultimately it is beneficial to others. Ultimately what is working through him as divinity is going to be bountifully blessing others only. So outwardly, why is that? That person came, he is shouting at people, you know, it's, it's also said that uh, the Guru is always angry and shouting. He is probably taking your karma away, you do not know. 
you do not know what is being done through him how it is going to benefit you even the apparent failings that you see outside are actually virtue it is a it's a virtue you where you will not know the uh, totality picture another angle to look at it is from how you know the character of desdemona is portrayed in othello she found a vice in her virtue not to do more than what is requested for if suppose somebody asked for some money she will gladly give it immediately 100 rupees means 100 rupees if she will immediately give after they have went she will think oh probably i should have given him more this sort of a feeling she gets and she treats this as a vice so if at all oh i should have done it you know it's my mistake this type of a vice if you have it actually leads to the virtue side so anyway look at it this is a very powerful line even his failings lean to virtue side thus to relieve the wretched was his pride and even his failings lean to virtue side but in his duty prompt at every call he washed and wept and he prayed and felt for all this person when we read the last uh, description we think that he has nothing else to do okay sitting in his house eating ha huh? who ever comes he entertain and they as though like as a psychiatrist listening to everybody's woes and nothing else to do in life no this is where a satvik actor is whatever ought to be done at that point of time he will do it with great enthusiasm with great uh, without delay at prompt but in due but in his duty prompt at every call swamiji said he learned all these poems particularly exposed to them at his young age by his father and his father also learned from probably his guru and others uh, so whenever anything has to be given as a indirect message like in the first poem we saw that air you remark another sin bit thy own conscience look within so swami ji said when we came from school and complained about somebody his father would patiently listen to that but not looking at the son directly later he would say air you remark another sin but they own conscience look that means he is indirectly giving the message all that is correct son but you also look within yourself this is the way by which he uh, educated the child so like that also as they are sitting discussing laughing also suddenly the bell rang rings and the milkman comes or something his father will spring out of the chair or sofa and say but in his duty prompt at every call and that is how he taught the poems also that is how he taught the values also he said thanks to him we have got a collection of poems through swami ji because swami ji's interest in the poems and english literature also was was probably kindled from there but in his duty prompt at every call so he was always ready and never ever shied away from doing the obligatory duty that has to be done of them what is that he washed and wept he prayed and felt for all he was the preacher there he was the person who is going to give knowledge in the church there all those duties none of it he failed actually at every correct time and the correct thing has to be done that he will exactly do so therefore here is a great uh, again a thought for us that it is the sort of the busiest man who finds time for everything he will do his duty but he is available for every person how this can happen this can happen only when you are able to um, plan your life in such a way that it is oriented towards the higher only so when you don't have time to waste on petty things in life you have enough time to do all those things and each and everything that you take up is in welfare of others it will be of good to others whether you write a book whether you build an academy whether you whatever you do do lectures there is enough time and such a person will not deny any appointment also anybody can approach him at any point of time and that is what we are going to see all the qualities that uh, you will find in this poem are reflected in all great mahatmas life actually he watched and wept he prayed and felt for all and then comes his this metaphor again is uh, quoted by swami ji mostly in uh, seminars it is talking about the leadership quality the teacher quality the leadership quality in him and this is also given in italics so it is a very important metaphor that we need to remember in this poem and as a bird each fond endearment tries to tempt its new fledged offspring to the skies he tried each art reproved each dull delay allured to brighter worlds and led the way underline the word led the way he is talking about a bird this bird what it does is it is now 
teaching or educating its young one which has just come out of the egg hatched and it's a new fledged offspring. So maybe first few hours, first few days, I do not know that bird is totally dependent there and it will uh, uh, wait for the mother to come feed it like that. Once the bird has grown little bit with some feathers and its legs are also strong now, it does not belong to the nest anymore. It belongs to the sky. That is where the bird belongs to. And it is very interesting how the bird allures the young ones to go to the towards the sky. So what it does is it keeps a small piece of uh, food or something next to the nest. Then it will make it come out. As it comes, it may pull it a little bit further and draw the bird towards the end of the branch. Slowly, slowly this bird also hops and follows the mother. Suddenly when it comes to the end of the branch, the mother bird flies away. And the child doesn't know or the, the young one doesn't know. Uh, the chick that also, uh, you know, flaps his wings and flies. That is how it is slowly led into the higher, higher uh, sky there. So this is what actually a leader does. And as a bird, each fond endearment tries to tempt its new fledged offspring to the skies. What does the leader do is that the leader does not show the way, the leader leads the way. And as he understands that this person is incapacitated now, he has to make him uh, make him understand what his true potential is. So therefore, he tried each hour to reprove each dull delay. So he does not approve of, no, I cannot do, when he is afraid, oh, come on man, you can do it. You know, that type of a thing he will put, uh, anything that they are trying to resist, he will not allow that. He will try each and every method to teach them. Why? Allude to the brighter worlds. You do not belong to the nest. You belong to there. Your freedom is somewhere there. Why are you constricting and restricting yourself here? And that he has seen and he knows the, this person also belongs to there. So therefore, as a true leader, he will slowly, slowly lead them into that path and make them see the brighter ones. So once the bird starts flying, then nothing else is required. It is dependent on the wings and it can fly anywhere. But this is how the mother bird slowly pulls it from its position to where its actual ultimate goal is. This is the leadership quality that we see in the village preacher here. Then he talks about his aura. What does his presence do? He is painting a picture of a person who is in the deathbed and by his side when this village preacher goes, what happens to him? Beside the bed where the parting life was laid and sorrow, guilt and pain by turns dismay, the reverend champion stood. At his control, despair and anguish fled the struggling soul. Comfort came down the trembling wretch to raise and his last faltering accents whispered praise. So a person is there in the deathbed. And when the life is spent in whatever way, in a normal general way that everybody's life is spent, uh, during that time what is running through his mind is so many sorrow, so many guilt, pain. Maybe he is thinking about his relationship or, uh, or various other things that he has done in his life. So many, at that point of time probably the thoughts that are running in our mind is not in our control also. They are the resultant of various things that where, how we have led our life all jumbled up and mixed up comes at that point of time where our stronger attachments are there those things come up and because of which pain is there sorrow is there certain things you thought you should do you have not done guilt is there so various emotions go through that person when he is in the final stages of his life but at that point of time this person comes as a great solace to such a person there the reverend champions too and what happens when in his presence, what happens? At his control, despair and anguish fled the struggling soul. So actually, this talks about a person who is internally very, very powerful and a spiritually very evolved person or a spiritually enlightened person. Once a person of such a stature comes into your vicinity, his vibration, you can say his frequency or his thought power that radiates a strength around a magnetic field is as where as it were created around him that impacts the other person in a very positive way. We see in this uh, tale of two cities 
final scene where uh, Sidney Carton who has uh, sacrificed his life as it were for the hero uh, I forgot his name um, Richard somebody he goes into the prison releases that person and he has taken his position uh, because in the French Revolution they are all going to guillotine him the next morning and one by one the prisoners are led in the uh, queue nobody has understood that person has changed and this person is now going to die for the other person he has voluntarily done that actually and only the cousin sister of the person is there in front of him and she turns back and says oh you are not my brother and uh, and then she understands or I forgot uh, he probably says whatever it is and then as a trembling and uh, uh, as a as a very trembling lady who approaches the guillotine because who will uh, approach death with a great uh, happiness no she is actually very fear fearful afraid very trembling but the moment she is able to see the calmness in the Sydney Carton's stature she also feels extremely relieved at that point of time his stature his inner uh, strength that gets actually passed on to her also and it is uh, probably she is able to take uh, that death more peacefully than how she would have taken it otherwise this is what happens actually so it is a, or this is what they call a spiritual aura and other things it is a direct uh, product of his wisdom mm. his wisdom is radiating as it were and uh, despair and anguish so that person is now extremely calm despair and anguish fled the struggling soul comfort he feels very comfortable now comfort came down trembling rich to rise and then what he does in the last faltering accents whispered praise whether praise of God or praise of the preacher we do not know but the point is his thoughts are now preoccupied with higher things and higher values imagine if a person who is going to die and his last thoughts are like this what else is required so that is going to lead him to a greater journey also ahead he feels peaceful at death and that is because of the presence of this person here and this portion talks about his wisdom his jnana at church with meek and unaffected grace his looks adorn the venerable place truth from his lips prevailed with double sway and fools who came to scoff remain to pray all are as I said very very powerful words that convey uh, convey the you know that stage of that person so he is giving sermon in the church he is the preacher he is the teacher with meek and unaffected grace very simple but is the grace is unaffected not because he is standing in a pulpit and people are respecting him or some may even uh, make fun of him or do whatever it is his voice there is extremely unaffected so he is rooted in himself where he is not touched by anything that's what we said in the beginning Sita Pranya says yes sarvatra na visneha tattat prapya shubhashabam na avinantati na dveshti he is not rejoicing he is not grieving he is an unaffected grace his grave is extremely equipoised equanimous in his mind at all points of time tasya pragnya pratishtita his wisdom is steadily established his looks around the venerable place as such it's a place for sermon but that place is enlivened by a living entity there that living entity is the village preacher and that is what is giving the respect to that place the value to that place truth from his lips veil with double sway he is talking truth there so that is what a preacher should do that is what a teacher should do what is given in the scriptures is the ultimate truth but why does he say double sway here? A lot of emphasis is there. He is talking from knowledge and wisdom. Who is ideal teacher? Ideal teacher is one who is well versed in teaching by knowledge of the Shastras or the scriptures. And also it is not a mere theoretical enunciation based on his knowledge. But by his standing on the truth. By his personal experience also. Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam says Mundaka Upanishad Jnani Tattvadarshi says Bhagavad Gita so ideal quality of a guru or a teacher is twofold 
one who is well versed with the scriptures who knows the knowledge and who knows the art of communication but he is not merely talking from the scriptures as a third person he also knows it from within as a living entity therefore when it comes like this it has an impact on others it is very powerful truth from his lips prevail with a double sway and how do we know that it has impact and fools who came to scoff remain to pray those who came just for the sake of fun there who uh, to play pranks there uh, or to you know cavil or cap all this is you know making fun of the pundit there or something like that people do that you know there are some people they were also positively impacted by his presence and what he was saying there the fools who came scoff came to scoff remain to pray remain to pray means their thought was directed towards god and that was the impact of his sermon or knowledge the service passed around the pious man with steady zeal each honest rustic ran even children followed with endearing wile and plucked his gown to share the good man's smile but he was a when he was in the position of the teacher he was in the position of a teacher but there was no egoistic notion that i am the teacher or i am the preacher very simple man available to all so this is the uh, one of the great qualities of a leader also that he is available to the last person in his organization also how we will relate to them is that according to the situation obviously but he will make sure that he is accessible so once the prayer is over once the sermon is over everybody is happy to mingle with him the service passed around the pious man with steady zeal each honest rustic and all the villagers were very happy and they were enthused to to circle around him to uh, to be with him and you know to have a formal if you want you, you meaning uh, you can call him i mean his number is available you can at any point of time uh, take an appointment and meet him or we even without that he is there available for all and not only just at the serious issues of uh, the adults even children followed with endearing wile and plucked his gown to share the good man's smile this again we see as a quality in very many great mahatmas as to how they relate with children so many even great saints uh, we can see swami chinmayananda is uh, uh, our parama guru is supposed to have those who have known him they know as uh, having a very rough exterior and very strict type of thing but inwardly you have to see the heart of these people if somebody particularly who is supposed to do the job properly if it's not that he is going to get the firing all that is suffer but when it comes to children he is totally in a very playful mood and very embracing mood all the time and this happens to all the great mahatmas definitely this is there and that is how you are able because they are able to feel comfortable with you and relate to you at their level here is a person who can just play with me that sort of a feeling is that a child also gets in his presence so even the child followed with the endearing wile uh, some prank that the child what it does and plug this gown and he will not say hey, what are you doing here you know this type of a thing not even for a moment it will come uh, all these things are you must not do you know in church you must play uh, you must not you must respect is child will play wherever it is whether it is church or anything so therefore they are able to understand the children at that level and play in plug this gown to share the good man's smile his ready smile a parents warmth expressed their welfare pleased him and their cares distressed so he was extremely happy about the welfare of the people around him that's about all and his ready smile had that warmth that i am there don't worry how a parent will be showing to the child like that was his relationship to others now comes the culmination or the climax of the poem again it is given in italics if you forget the whole poem also just by heart the last six lines uh, very important very powerful very deep vedantic message to them his heart his love his griefs were given but all his serious thoughts had rest in heaven as some tall cliff that lifts its awful form swells from the vale and midway leaves the storm the round its breast the rolling clouds are spread eternal sunshine settles on its head so vedanta talks about development of intellect 
Vedanta also talks about chastening your emotions. People who do not understand Vedanta properly will think that or may come to a conclusion that Vedanta kills emotion. That is not the case. Vedanta chastens your emotions. Vedanta makes you more objective and more available for you to even have deeper emotions. Emotions are the aspect of your mind. And thinking, reasoning, discrimination, these are the functions of the intellect. So here is a man of perfection here. A man of perfection is one who has all the pure emotions in him. But he does not allow the emotions to decide on the course of actions in his life. Emotions is a virtue. If you do not feel for others, then there is something wrong with you. But even this positive emotions, when you become emotional at every point of time, then you will not be able to be of even service to the other people. Now, how can this type of a relationship we can have? To have, so one is to be indifferent and I go to Himalayas and meditate and I am not bothered about others. That's not, the, that's not what is uh, recommended. You are there, you are available for others, you feel exactly the same as others. That is identification. That is why he said, to them his heart, his love, his griefs were given. Others joy is my joy, others sorrow is my sorrow. This is called as love. Others grief is my grief. So he was able to relate to them exactly at their level and he was not faking. He was not trying to even put up a show, but it was very genuine that he was able to share. But all these things did not have any affectation on his personality. How is this possible? Extreme objectivity, extreme strength. This can only happen when you are rooted in your core personality. When, that is why in the uh, next line it says, but all his serious thoughts had rest in heaven. So here is a very great message again. Your serious thoughts in life must always rest in heaven. Serious thoughts in life means most people take all the experiences and what they go through in life in very, very serious way. Vedanta says that should not be the case. Your serious thought is what you are given this human birth for. That alone you think about it. That I am supposed to realize the self and that is what uh, my uh, my business in life is. So therefore, when you take that heaven here, which is given in capital H, referring to father in heaven or kingdom of heaven, as it is said in uh, the, in the uh, Bible also, which is referring to that supreme state of self. When you say kingdom of heaven is within you, it has to refer to that. No, no other way that it can be interpreted. So if you are thoughts are centered around the self at all points of time. In other words, if the intellect is perched on that thought of reality at all points of time, at your emotional level, you can relate with everybody at their level. And you are available for them to give the purest of emotions to them also. But not one bit will affect you. And this is the difference between a person who is going through the emotions and becoming a victim of it, but going through the emotions and not becoming a victim of it. This is possible for us only when you are attuned to that Shruti as a Carnatic music singer or a player is attuned to that Tanpura behind that go through the various Raga and Tala in the, in the concert. Like that you can go through various emotions and experiences in life, but you have always kept that Shruti going at the back of your mind. All your serious thoughts at rest in heaven. Once a person, so therefore this shows both the state and the path. The absolute state of perfection is that you are rooted in the reality and moving about in the world like that. And the path is that you have to practice this objectivity. In each and every experience of life, try to be a witness of it by connecting to the self at that point of time. So it may be difficult in the beginning to practice this, but once you practice this like that, driving a car or something, you will do various things without losing the main function of what you are driving the car for. It is possible. You will drink Pepsi also, though it is not recommended. You may take the hands of steering also, but then one aspect of your personality is constantly there on the road and you know what it is to, what you are actually doing. Like that is that serious thoughts in heaven. Um, but all the serious thoughts had, had rest in heaven. And this, it gives us a metaphor or a beautiful example. Um, 
as some tall cliff that lifts its awful form, a majestic form. So in the series of mountain ranges, suddenly a tall cliff comes and it's suddenly rising above the rest. Midway uh, swells from the vale, it swells from the, all the valleys in a, to a great height. Midway leaves the storm. Storm refers to all the clouds and other things which is there in the middle of that mountain but it has grown so tall. Though round its breast, the rolling clouds are spread. The clouds are settled around the breast portion of the uh, mountain which is towards the middle of the mountain but eternal sunshine settles on its end. This word eternal is also very powerful here. It is a perfect uh, permanent state of self-realization. So once a person is rooted in that self, there will be eternal sunshine on your head. This thought of self, the permanent state of self is a state that you, once you enter, it is completely there. You are never going to deviate away from that. From that position, whatever happens, it is not going to touch you or affect you. We will just repeat this last six lines. To them, his heart, his love, his griefs were given, but all his serious thoughts had rest in heaven, as some tall cliff that lifts its awful form, swells from the veil and midway leaves the storm, though round its breast the rolling clouds are spread, eternal sunshine settles on its head. Oliver Goldsmith. Before we conclude, uh, we will just listen to Swamiji's one minute commentary here. Oliver Goldsmith's description of the village preacher portrays human perfection. The preacher's personality serves as an ideal for human beings to strive and reach. The village preacher led a modest and peaceful life, not enamored by attractions of the modern world. He was more skilled to raise the poor than to rise himself ever dutiful and charitable in nature. The poet compares the preacher to a bird leading its fledglings from their nest to the open skies. He too allured his fellow beings to greater and nobler life and himself led the way. The last few lines contain another beautiful metaphor comparing the preacher to a tall cliff. A cliff rises far above the valley and midway leaves the clouds. All disturbances of rain and storm remain below the level of the mountain's breast. The sun shines eternally on its peak. So too, the preacher's feelings and emotions Fathers remained with his heart. They never disturbed his serene attunement with the supreme reality. Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Shanti